My name is Manolis Pratinakis, and I'm a departmental lecturer in migration studies and the CSOCs Onassis Fellow at the School of Anthropology at the University of Oxford. Uh, this term, in fact, the COMPASS seminar series is co-convened with CSOCs. CSOCs is the Center for the Study of Southeastern Europe at Oxford. And the uh, seminar series broadly addresses the theme of the politics of emigration. Migrants, by the mere fact of crossing national borders, they challenge ideologies which make claims for the territorial and ethnic boundedness of the national entity. And thus, they are often seen as kind of problematic exceptions to the nationalist uh, image of normal life. And there is very rich literature, indeed, in migration studies, which problematizes such ideologies for their negative uh, impact on migrants as soon as they reach destination countries. However, uh, there is much less attention on the role of these same nation-centric ideologies in um, uh, shaping and informing emigration representations in countries of origin. And this is where we turn our attention at in this seminar series. Because from this same nation-centric uh, perspective, one can say that emigration is inherently uh, contested. It has an inherently contested character. On the one hand, um, it indicates and also symbolizes a certain failure of the state, that is uh, large scale emigration is seen as happening where and when states fail. And on the other hand, it often goes together with the production of negative representations of those who leave, who are seen as betraying the nation by exiting. More recently, uh, it has been observed by the diaspora literature that possibly a shift may be happening uh, whereby governments are changing the narratives in denouncing immigrants as deserters and they are embracing them. Um, uh, they design poli uh, pol policies, uh, institutions uh, which treat them more or less as the, the nation outside the bounds of the state. And we will be looking at this and asking to what extent this can be said to be true. What variations can we identify uh, between different, uh, when comparing different uh, states and also looking within uh, states, what are the different actors which shape discourses on emigration and how do those feed in on policies which aim to regulate exit and govern uh, citizens abroad. And lastly, and very importantly, how do emigrants themselves respond to such representation? The series comprises three seminars starting from today. And the next one is on what uh, is described in Oxford Terminology Week 5. Um, that is the 27th of May. Uh, it's always on Thursdays, 4 o'clock. The next uh, session will be looking at the relationship between illiberalism and emigration. And the speaker will be Ivan Krastev. And the week after, so 3rd of June, uh, we'll be uh, looking at emigrants and emigration states and the contested relationship between the two. And we will be having Roger Waldiger and Alexandra Delano Alonso. Today, the topic is um, uh, emigration states, the notion of existential sovereignty and migrant responses. And we're really delighted to have with us Datsa Zenovska and Elena Zenova. Datsa is obviously very well known to everyone here in Oxford. She's Associate Professor in Anthropology of Migration at the University of Oxford and the principal investigator of the SRC Emptiness Project. She holds a doctoral and master's degree uh, in uh, social cultural anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley, as well as a master's degree in humanities and social thought from New York University. Her research interests, broadly speaking, pertain to the changing relationships between people, territory, political authority, and capital in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And currently, in the context of the Emptiness Project, uh, she's researching the emptying towns and villages in Eastern Europe and Russia in order to understand what it means to live and govern emptying places. And we'll be adding the link of this fascinating uh, project on the chat so that you uh, visit and explore the uh, website of the project. Elena Zenova is uh, assistant professor in sociology and social uh, uh, in sociology at the University of Nottingham. 
the research interests lie in intra-EU mobility, EU citizenship, identities and belonging, othering, and migrant integration. She has done extensive research on uh, uh, the Bulgarian highly skilled migration to the UK, focusing on uh, the responses of the migrants to othering discourses, both in the host country in the UK and uh, Bulgaria. And uh, more recently, together with uh, Elisabetta Zontini, they are working on a project which looks at the integration of EU migrant workers in Brexit Britain. Before I give the floor to Datze, who will speak first, a few um, words to explain a little bit the setup of today's uh, seminar. Uh, each speaker will speak for approximately 20 minutes. And then uh, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, please um, um, put your questions, remarks, comments on the chat, and I will read them to uh, the presenters. Um, in case um, we have uh, hopefully time, I may invite you to read them, to op open your mic and uh, read them yourselves. And from here onward, I would like to please ask you to uh, keep your cameras and my mics switched off. And I would like to turn to Datze. Datze, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present from Rezekne, Latvia. I'm in uh, my field site at the moment. And this presentation uh, will not be on emptiness. <laughs> it actually is based on my um, contribution to a volume. Let me show you the volume, if I manage to do this. Um, um, this one, <laughs> to a volume edited by Rebecca Bryant and Madeline Reeves on sovereignty as a claim and desire exhibited by people rather than states. Uh, the book is an invitation to take seriously, seriously vernacular sovereign aspirations alongside the focus on sovereignty as an attribute of state power waning or not. It actually, uh, I have to say, uh, it also draws on discussions on shifting forms of power that I've had with Nick Wynn here at Compass. And those of you who've been at Compass long enough will remember that we convened a seminar around that theme some years ago. I'm not going to go into the rich and multidisciplinary debates about sovereignty in this presentation. Uh, for today's purposes, it will suffice to say that while there, while there are few things that scholars working on sovereignty agree on, I think it is fair to say that most agree on at least two things. One, that the state is not the only actor exercising forms of uh, power that entail sovereign attributes, that there are other agents such as individuals, corporations, international organizations, God and capital that contend for the position of the sovereign in specific encounters. And two, that sovereignty's relationship with territory is changing. I will agree on both counts as well, but I will add people as a subject contending for sovereignty and not only as a subject over whom sovereign power is exercised or as a subject used to legitimate state power. And I will also say that even though sovereignty is being de or rather re-territorialized, spatial coordinates remain important for it. I will elaborate these two points via ethnographic material uh, on Latvian migrants in the UK. It is likely that some of you will think at some point of my presentation that it, this is just another case of long distance nationalism. Let me preempt this then and say that in my view, the long distance nationalism literature does not quite get to the consequential shifts uh, in the relationship between territory, people and political authority that I'm trying to get at. So please bear with me. There are a few basic things that you need to know uh, before we move on. One is that in the story that Latvians tell themselves about themselves, the Latvian cultural nation and national state as a state established for the purpose of self-realization of the cultural nation are embattled. The sense of embattlement derives from the proximity of uh, proximity to Russia as a potential aggressor and the presence of a large and as many Latvians think disloyal Russian speaking minority whose position in relation to political power has shifted radically since the collapse of the Soviet Union. The threat of Russia is widely considered to be, uh, and, and the Russian speaking minority, is widely considered to be the legacy of Soviet occupation, that is of a period of unfreedom. 
However, in conditions of post-Soviet freedom, there has emerged another unexpected threat that has lost one third of its population since the 1990s and the country approximately 27%, not all of course uh, to migration uh, to the West Western Europe, but uh, this is just a number I'll put out there. Um, and let me also just share this screen for orienting purposes. Um, another bit of information. So of the 1.86 million remaining residents, 62% uh, are Latvians, 25% Russians, and the rest are Poles, Jews, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, and so forth. Um, there are about 1.6 million uh, Latvians in the world, self-identified and otherwise. Uh, that's the population of South London. And 30% of those live outside uh, the country. So what does it mean when a significant number of individuals who supposedly constitute the state bearing nation that legitimates the existence and legal identity of the Latvian state leave or don't return from post World uh, War II exile as the case may be. Put another way, what does freedom of movement mean for an embattled nation. In contrast to nationalism's constitutive threats, embodied embattled uh, nationhood refers to a, a situation whereby a culturally distinct people claim a state while at the same time exhibiting deep existential fear about a potential breakdown of the articulation of the people with the state, potentially leading to the loss of the state. In addition to perceiving the existence of a national state as a guarantor for the existence of the people, Latvian politicians and members of the public also perceive the existence of the state as an indication of political maturity and civilizational status. As a, remember, uh, as a member of a conservative um, political force said in a public uh, demonstration against corruption in July 2017, and I quote, not every people have their own state. We have our own state and we have to protect it, end quote. This is to say that Latvian existential fears and desires emerge within a modernist developmental frame, whereby only a people that has a state has become a mature and democratic people insofar as it has evolved from an ethnic group to a mature nation with consciousness, political will, and the ability to establish, uphold, and protect its own state. This developmental frame cuts across various political regimes from a liberal to socialist to post-colonial. If the uh, for example, the Soviet party state sorted peoples into ethnic groups, nationalities, and nations, depending on whether they exhibited national consciousness and had political institutions. Uh, Post-colonial post nations too strive to become sovereign moderns with the right to a passport, a flag, a stamp, a coin, and the formation of a native state in the words of Yarimar Bonilla, who actually also criticizes these sovereign aspirations of post-colonial states. Having one's own state, or what Rebecca Bryant and Madeleine Reeves call state desire, is important for Latvians who wish to be recognized as historical and political agents who shape their own lives, that is, as a people with sovereign agency. I speak of these aspirations in the rubric of existential sovereignty. The concept of existential sovereignty pertains to the ability to bring into existence a people and their state and to ensure the continued physical and political existence of both. Rather than, or in addition to, ensuring control over territory or fighting for the right to self-determination, existential sovereignty pertains to practices that co-constitute the subject that can aspire for sovereign agency and the political institutions that make the subject politically recognizable and capable of agentive action. It adds an additional layer to theories of sovereignty by suggesting that individual bodies are not the only sites upon which sovereign power can be and is exercised, are, are not only sites upon which uh, sovereign power uh, can be and is exercised, but can also become embodiments of sovereignty. Territorial state is important for existential sovereignty, but it also allows for the distribution of collective selfhood across territories of several historically existing states. It could be said that existential sovereignty entails a transfer of political sovereignty from a territorially defined state to a re-territorialized collective self 
that operates transnationally alongside corporations, international organizations, God, and other actors that compete for the status of the sovereign. So let me switch to uh, the ethnographies. In 2011, a group of Russian speaking activists initiated a referendum on the introduction of the Russian as the second state language in Latvia. This initiative came in response to the post Soviet states language politics, which aimed to counter the effects of Soviet nationalities policy by designating Latvian as the state language and regulating language use in public sphere. Despite expert calculations that the referendum did not pose a serious threat to the Latvian language and thus the national foundation of the state, the fact that a significant portion of Latvia's Russian-speaking citizenry supported it exacerbated the sense of embattlement among Latvians, including among those residing abroad. As a result, the language referendum turned out to be the most widely attended referendum after the restoration of independence with voting stations all over the world. The referendum produced not only high vo voter turnout, but also what Ivan Arenas and I have previously described as barricade sociality, namely an affective and visceral togetherness that conjured up a sovereign people with, a, with constituent power. And um, here you can see, let's see. Um, I'll just show you some images from the line that formed outside the, the Latvian embassy. Uh, in, in, the, in, in, in London, um, where people stood in rain as they then the after recounted um, to, to vote to, in this referendum. Later on, people sang songs and engaged in all kinds of uh, effervescent activities. Um, so in this video, this elderly man that came on screen, right when I stopped sharing my screen, uh, points out that the referendum is an unprecedented event when a people wish to defend their rights to language while living in another country and standing in a very long line in rain. Another man in the video uh, refused to speak uh, in Latvian and stated in English that he voted for making Russian the second state language in Latvia. The tension and therefore the sense of embattlement uh, was palpable. Another man originally from an Eastern region of Latvia, actually where I am right now, but residing in London for three years explained in Latvian that he has come to vote for a different Latvia, for a Latvia that can find a compromise, for a Latvia that is willing to accommodate people who speak Russian and thus prevent them from leaving the country. A young woman born and raised in London within a post-World War II immigrant family, but holding Latvian citizenship said that she had come to vote because language is, and I quote, the flag of our state. Another woman also born in a post-World War II immigrant family stated that she's voting against the motion to make, to make Russian the second state language because she doesn't wish to go to her state as she put it and not be able to participate in public life because it takes place in Russian. Civil servants and activists involved with diaspora politics were very pleased with the political activity of Latvia's citizens abroad. They thought that their political activity demonstrated the unbreakable link between a people and their state, even if the two did not live together. Despite the fact that the results of the referendum were positive for ethnic Latvians, the Latvian public legal experts and politicians found it worrisome that the foundational aspects of the state could be subjected to a popular vote, thus opening the possibility that a demographically reconfigured people might undo the national foundations of the state through democratic process. The president's constitutional rights commission argued that popular sovereignty was most misused here, that the actually existing people did not have the authority to change the foundations of the state once such had been established by the constitutive power of the original people. And the original constitutive power, they argued, that is the constitutional rights commission, most certainly belonged to Latvians as a cultural nation, they argued, with a political will to establish their own state. This 2012 opinion of the Constitutional Rights Commission served as justification for the constitutional reform that followed in 2014. 
As part of this reform, the parliament approved a preamble to the Latvian constitution for the purpose of rendering the implicit constitutional core explicit. That is for the purpose of stating that the Latvian state is a national state established by Latvians and for the purpose of ensuring the continuity and flourishing of the cultural nation of Latvians. The opinion posits two immutable features of the Latvian constitution, the legal identity of the state, that is the Latvian nature of the state, and the political order of the state, namely democracy. And insofar as both of these are enshrined, one cannot cancel out the other. These two features, the commission argues, cannot be changed by a demographically defined people, that is the majority of the current body of citizenry, because then the actually existing people would be violating the legal order established by the constitutive people. The only way to change the legal identity and the political order is through revolution, which the commission, not surprisingly, did not recommend. The opinion also states that a politically mature people requires its own state if it is to operate in the international community, thus providing a legal argument for what exists in the public sphere as an existential state desire and civilizational aspiration. Moreover, the Commission explicitly addresses the question of mobility insofar as the opinion states that, and I quote, everyone who considers himself or herself as belonging to the Latvian nation has a relationship with the Latvian state. Between every Latvian, regardless of where he's located and the Latvian state, there is real sociologically identifiable nationally cultural tie, end quote. The political nation can be more expans expansive, the commission concludes, and include minorities, but this does not in any way affect the state-bearing function of the Latvian cultural nation. The language referendum and the constitutional reform that followed reiterates the constitutive link between the self, the cultural nation, and the Latvian state. Importantly, the claims to existential sovereignty that these events and practices entail allow for a reterritorialization of the nation, while at the same time affirming the importance of a territorial state. In such conditions, when existential sovereignty seems to be the primary form of sovereignty of concern to the Latvian polity, other functions of the state, such as care for the population as a social body, become less important and can be more easily delegated to other states. For example, if the Latvian state is widely recognized to be crucial for the continued existence of the nation, the British state might be recognized as better able to care for the physical bodies of the members of the nation, whether by providing employment or services. As a result, Latvia's residents living in the United Kingdom happily pay taxes in the UK, which they tried to avoid when they lived in Latvia, while at the same time standing in line in rain to vote in the referendum. Thus, statecraft and sovereignty come to be disarticulated from each other and distributed across territories of several historically existing states. What looks like good old distance nationalism is a re-territorialization of the nation. Is it possible that in the future, the center of the polity and not only the nation will shift from the territory of the state to a trans-statal network and that this will not be seen as the loss of the state, but as an emergence of a post-statal polity? Probably not, at least not in the near future, but large scale emigration does raise the question. Interestingly, transition from a territorial to a network-based polity is a vision articulated by Julia Cooper in her engagement with Judith Butler's attempt to rethink the Jewish nation from an ethno-religious to a diasporic polity. Butler argues that diasporic ethics is relational because of constant negotiation with the other and therefore superior to ethno-religious nationalism as a foundation for the Israeli polity. Cooper uh, pushes this line of thinking further and suggests that while Butler's progressive vision remains bound to territory and therefore cannot overcome the limits of ethno-religious nationalism, what is needed instead is a re-territorialization of the polity itself so that its spatial contours correspond to the diasporic ethic at its foundation. I'm not sure. I agree that re-territorialization necessarily supports a relational and open-ended diasporic ethic. From what I can see from Eastern European diaspora politics, nationalism is best cultivated in a deterritorialized way because there is less accountability to territorially bound citizens who may or may not be part of the ethnic nation. 
Outside of civic constraints, it seems, you can be as nationalist as you want. You can even expand territorially by placing the nation in historical lands rather than national territory, as in the vision uh, for Greater Hungary. Again, you could say that it is not unusual for diasporas to be more nationalistic than origin communities, but it is the shifts in the relationship between political authority, territory, and people, and the emergence of corresponding institutions, which is what I think we really should be paying attention to, that are engendering something new that we are just beginning to uh, trace and understand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tatsa, for a fascinating presentation. And uh, I will turn now to Elena, and I would also like to invite you all to um, put your questions already in the chat in case you know they come to mind. So, Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry, just a couple of seconds. My my uh, monitor froze for a second here. Um, right. Hopefully, um, hopefully all we, all of you can see my presentation. Can you can you see my presentation slides? Not yet, but I guess it will upload. Wait a bit. Is it showing? Not yet. I knew there would be a glitch. <laughs> okay, let me just try again. Okay. Yes, it now seems to be working. I haven't ah, seen any yet. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you. Sorry about that. I knew I knew there would be a, a glitch. Um, so um hi everybody. It's wonderful to um, you know, to join you virtually from uh, Nottingham. And I just wanted to very briefly say a huge thank you to uh, Manolis and everybody at Compass and CSOX for inviting me uh, to be with you today and share a couple of uh, uh, reflections on, on my research that I've been doing uh, um, with uh, uh, Bulgarian migrants uh, in, in the UK. Um, so again, you know, there are just a couple of reflections and hopefully just a kind of... Uh, um, you know, uh, the start of a dialogue um, about uh, the experiences of Bulgarian migrants uh, in, in the UK. And I just briefly, uh, before I, I begin, I, I just wanted to clarify why I've, uh, I've put Bulgarian diaspora in kind of inverted comma. And that's because um, um, what my research in the last uh, 10 years or so has um, demonstrated is that the Bulgarian community uh, in the UK and elsewhere in the world is actually incredibly fragmented and incredibly divided. So I wanted to kind of signal uh, in some way uh, that division. But as a way of starting uh, my talk today, I actually wanted to tell you a story uh, as a way of kind of provoking you to think about uh, Bulgarian migration. And this story comes from uh, one of my participants that um, I interviewed now a long time ago, back in 2014, uh, as part of one of my projects. And I kind of asked him, okay, so why did you choose? And I was doing field work in Scotland at the time. Um, so I was very interested to, to speak to this uh, politics student uh, and to explore the reasons uh, as to why he chose to uh, study in Scotland rather than in Bulgaria. And this, this little anecdote that I often you know, uh, share uh, with a lot of people actually I think really beautifully captures uh, kind of the case of Bulgarian immigration. So he kind of looked at me, he was like, let me just tell you a story, uh, something that is kind of a running joke that we have got in uh, our family, but something that is also true. Uh, so as a way of answering um, his question, he said, well, you know how in Bulgaria there is this tradition of uh, naming your children after their grandparents. And, you know, this is the case in Bulgaria and I'm sure in other countries, uh, Balkan or non-Balkan countries uh, for that matter. So he was really fascinated by the fact that his parents didn't name him after uh, his grandfather. And he have used Sudanese uh, and tried to kind of capture the essence. So 
perhaps doesn't uh, you know work particularly well with the pseudonyms here, but he you know he said my granddad was called Marin, which is a very kind of traditional name, means from the sea. So he asked his parents, okay, but why didn't you name me straight after him? And he, apparently his parents had turned around and said, well, actually we were discussing names um, that could be easily pronounced in English. So he said, and basically uh, you can see what the disillusioned parents of our generation thought uh, that they're bringing up pilgrims or future immigrants. And I think the story really beautifully captures, um, you know, what, what I've, I've been really fascinated by, you know, uh, why um, people are leaving Bulgaria and choosing either to study or work abroad. Uh, but also it shows how deeply embedded this uh, migration or emigration narrative is actually in kind of in the Bulgarian everyday in the public and political discourse as well. And also I think it also captures um, kind of the essence of the newest uh, uh, Bulgarian migratory um, outflows and those um, uh, that are associated with the post-EU uh, uh, accession and kind of the various generational differences. So in kind of um, um, a lot of Bulgarian sociological studies, particularly here I'm envisaging the work of Petr Emil Mitov and Sika Kovacheva, um, the, the kind of the fall of communism, um, and I'm sure that is the case actually in a, in a lot of post-communist uh, countries as well, is kind of seen as this uh, transformative societal shift that has also completely reshaped the values of, you know, generations to follow. So very often uh, in that literature, um, uh, those who were born shortly before the transition and shortly after are very much kind of perceived as the children of the transition. So, uh, or as they framed uh, in uh, Petr Mil uh, Mitofensik Kovacheva's research as the new Bulgarians, so people with new values that supposedly are very different from their parents. Uh, but at the same time, you know, so this is, so Marco is very much kind of uh, part of, of that generation and his parents uh, also belong to a generation that also in the Bulgarian literature is seen as, as incredibly divided as a result of the arguably never ending transition to democracy. And as Evgenia Kalinov and Iskra Baeva point out in their research, actually the transition in Bulgaria um, has, uh, particularly the kind of early 90s, has uh, deeply polarized uh, the Bulgarian nation, dividing into the winners and the losers of the transition. And a lot of these losers became kind of disillusioned with, with the way uh, transition to democracy was happening and how change was actually occurring. And many actually saw uh, migration as as kind of uh, as a solution to that problem as a way out so either they themselves migrated or in fact as we can see here um you know that th that was something that they were preparing their children for so this kind of uh very short anecdote really uh uh kind of clearly captures uh um this very uh nuanced phenomenon uh the kind of the different generational differences in the values embedded and um, actually illustrates uh, the salience of immigration in the Bulgarian everyday public discourse and uh, as well, you know, media coverage and representations. So what I've been doing in the last couple of years is kind of focusing uh, precisely on trying to understand uh, the reasons why uh, people choose to migrate and also what their experiences are like. And these experiences have very much, as I will demonstrate later on, uh, been shaped by, you know, ultimately, um, kind of uh, uh, experiences um, that um, uh, they've been very much uh, shaped by kind of uh, political and uh, the political and socio-economic uh, instability in the country and the various shifts and, and changes. Um, and a lot of the kind of uh, particularly negative discourses associated with migration have um, uh, very clearly come to the fore in these moments of crisis. Uh, but in the next couple of minutes, I'll share some data from two empirical uh, projects that, you know, Manolis actually already briefly talked about. Um, so my earlier work focused on um, uh, highly skilled migration, Bulgarian migration in the UK, um, and uh, it was a multi-sided ethnographic study um, that was carried out at a particularly crucial uh, point of time, so shortly uh, before and after 
um, the labor restrictions um, for Bulgarian migrants, Bulgarians and Romanians were subject to labor restrictions, as I'm sure many of you are aware. So shortly around that time, um, uh, Bulgarians and Romanians kind of came very um, clearly to the fore, the kind of public domain discourses, particularly uh, in, in the UK. So I was very interested in how they're responding to those discourses, but also the discourses uh, in, in the home country uh, at the time. And actually, that project very much kind of captured the initial wave of uh, uh, kind of um, migratory outflows from the country uh, that uh, demonstrated that these were predominantly young people under 35. Um, and they were um, largely uh, highly skilled. So here, highly skilled, understood broadly as people who were able to successfully negotiate their credentials in the home society. Now, the second, um, the second kind of project uh, is, uh, well, began in uh, 2018 with uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Elisabetta Zontini, and it's still currently uh, ongoing. Uh, it's slightly different, so we're looking at EU migrant workers' experiences, their um, settlement practices as well, and we're looking at both Italians and Bulgarians, but obviously here I'm focusing just on, on the Bulgarian um, sample. And again, that was another kind of crucial political moment, uh, because it happened at a time when, um, um, you know, uh, Bulgarians who had just finally, um, you know, kind of negotiated their place as EU citizens were, um, uh, or, you know, were able to access the labor market freely. Finally, um, that place was again um, questioned uh, um, as the country was trying to negotiate its way out of uh, the EU. Um, and again, that also corresponds to uh, the migratory flows that we observe um, uh, out of Bulgaria in, in kind of uh, uh, the last uh, five or so years that demonstrate that this is mostly low skilled migration. Um, and um, again, so that project kind of focused on the broader range of projects. So, um, in my work, I've also explored the ways in which, you know, crossing borders in times of crisis produces anxieties in both host and home societies alike. Uh, alike. And uh, in fact, I've previously argued that migrants uh, find themselves exposed to uh, the so-called double-sided uh, uh, othering, which is uh, a discursive realm, um, you know, kind of transnational space where uh, home and host society discourses of othering operate simultaneously. Uh, to stigmatize individuals and impact this upon their identities and their sense of belonging. However, today's focus uh, will be explicitly um, on the discourses in relation to emigration produced in Bulgaria, uh, which, as I demonstrate, are really emotionally charged, polarizing, and indeed quite uh, uh, divisive. And of course, I'll, I'll talk a lot about othering um, and identity. So I'll be drawing. Um, so my kind of understanding of identity is very much uh, uh, discursive and relational drawing uh, here on the work of Hall and Bauman. Uh, but as well, it, when I talk about identity, I'll mostly kind of draw on the work of Jensen, who sees identity as this, um, not as a passive categorization of a group of uh, people, but rather as, as a kind of as a space for resistance, as, a, as an expression of oppositional uh, agency. Um, and this is uh, something that uh, Bulgarian migrants in the UK and elsewhere kind of try to um, uh, kind of capitalize on, um, sometimes trying to refute othering discourses, sometimes uh, building on them further uh, in order to uh, renegotiate their place uh, in relation to the uh, motherland. Uh, but just very briefly, um, you know, I just wanted to show the scale of the phenomenon and, you know, uh, to show, to kind of, kind of give a little bit of uh, information, uh, statistical information in relation to uh, Marco's narrative here. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of statistics, but um, I just wanted to kind of highlight a couple of uh, points um, uh, that emigration um, has been quite a prominent trend uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and what I find quite fascinating, the data itself uh, can be quite contradictory, but according to the latest uh, data from the Bulgarian Foreign Ministry, actually, what I find quite fascinating here is that uh, allegedly the, pop the population living and working abroad in 2018 
was larger than the working population in the country, which I find uh, quite fascinating. So, you know, uh, how important this phenomenon uh, really is. And also uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight as well um, is um, a kind of a tendency of uh, kind of increase of Bulgarians living in the UK. And this is something it's that is not necessarily... I mean, in Italy, though, this is not necessarily something that has changed uh, with the referendum. In fact, um, as the uh, latest uh, study by, by Evgenia Markova and Russell King uh, point out, actually, um, there is a, an increase uh, in Bulgarians living in the UK uh, since uh, the referendum. So again, uh, rather than, you know, uh, we're seeing kind of the opposite tendency of what, you know, has been happening to the majority of um, EU migrants uh, in, the U in the UK as a result of uh, the referendum. My second provocation comes in, in the shape of a quote uh, that is by uh, Dr. Ivan Gadjev. He's a um, kind of a prominent Bulgarian political uh, emigrant. He's somebody uh, whose family was murdered by the communist regime and he himself was um, uh, persecuted for his political views uh, by the communist regime. So eventually in 1968, he managed to cross the border with G Germany, sorry, not uh, the border with Germany, sorry, with Greece, and uh, eventually managed to migrate to um, uh, Detroit to Michigan, where in 1976, um, uh, he was able to establish an institute dedicated to the history of Bulgarian emigration in Northern America. So very much kind of a representative of old uh, migratory flows uh, in, in the country. Um, and what he says actually is kind of the other kind of uh, aspect that I've really been interested in, uh, particularly the relationship between uh, those who choose to migrate and those who choose uh, to stay. And he says that there are two Bulgarians in the world. One is here, meaning in Bulgaria, and the other one is made up by our fellow countrymen who live abroad. And they, those two are separated. And what he's really kind of... Um, pointing to is this rift uh, between uh, migrants and non-migrants and uh, this rift is very much kind of embedded in um, uh, the various political uh, discourses um, associated with political uh, particular political changes in the country but also uh, ways in which uh, migration was actually conceptualized and perceived and a lot of this uh, narrative um, kind of comes from uh, particularly um, uh, during communist uh, regime, um, uh, the kind of migration was very much uh, framed as, as a national betrayal, as, as, a, um, a, as a kind of uh, act of treason uh, as such. So very negative connotations. Um, um, and then following that, um, you know, the, the kind of the migratory flows that uh, followed in the early 90s were very much uh, uh, based on um, uh, people being very disillusioned with the democratic changes, as I already mentioned earlier. So in, in the Bulgarian discursive space, um, the departures lounge of Sofia Airport has got a very important symbolic space. It's not simply a liminal space of, of, uh, of being, but also it's a, it's a kind of a, a liminal space um, that um, divides a nation. It doesn't necessarily just mean, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean dividing uh, or kind of highlighting particular uh, life choice, but also uh, it also serves to highlight a divided nation. Um, and very often kind of the narratives around migration um, have oscillated or kind of uh, varied from perceiving it or depicting it as an act of treason through uh, to, you know, at the, at the very least as, as a form of uh, escapism. Um, and more recently, um, these narratives have started uh, to change, particularly in kind of the late 90s, early 2000s. There was a, a recognition of um, the Bulgarian diaspora as, as an asset uh, to the country. So that also manifested itself in a, in a number of state approaches uh, to immigration that focused on three particular areas professional, cultural, and political. So in, in kind of the professional uh, aspect, uh, there were a lot of governmental in, um, initiatives, uh, such as the Bulgarian Easter, or initiatives such as Korea in Bulgaria, why not, uh, you know, these kind of forums that were trying to attract um, foreign educated um, 
um, Bulgarians to return to the country and again uh, benefit from uh, kind of the human capital developed over the years. Kind of the cultural efforts focus more around uh, the establishment of a state agency for Bulgarians abroad uh, and uh, kind of the main uh, function of that agency has been really support for cultural initiatives around the world and trying to maintain that relationship with uh, the Bulgarian uh, diaspora. Now, the final aspect is quite also interesting is that kind of the political aspect, which has focused quite a lot on trying to attract potential mobilizing um, uh, the vote abroad, which has been quite prominent in even in the most uh, recent elections. But at the same time, uh, this has always been something that um, has uh, resulted in a very careful balance um, um, uh, of, of the impact that this might have uh, on uh, the country um, as such. Um, and particularly, you know, there have been quite a lot of concerns around how uh, the votes abroad should be counted um, and uh, what sort of impact they should play uh, on the country itself. So, Ultimately, to kind of summarize at various periods, you know, the perception of the Bulgarian di diaspora has really kind of fluctuated between, you know, perceiving it as an asset uh, in terms of not only kind of financial benefits such as remittances, but also know how and uh, human capital, but also kind of seeing it um, as almost the easy way out of the country as a form of national betrayal or, a, you know, in some cases, uh, even as a threat. So what I would like to focus on in the next couple of minutes very briefly is look at some of the strategies that Bulgarians um, in the UK have employed in order to try and counterbalance some of these othering discourses, particularly discourses focusing on um, narratives around national betrayal, escapism, kind of, uh, and uh, sort of um, um, kind of portraying migration as, as, a, as a kind of easy way out of the very difficult situation in the country. So one of these strategies um, has been um, uh, a strategy of dismissal. Um, and it's, uh, it's very interesting because some participants here very categorically dismiss the home society uh, based othering discourses on the basis of narrow minded thinking and lack of understanding of the difficulties that one encounters uh, in migration. And particularly with regards to the latter, um, Ivan, who's a young professional, here says that, you know, I bet anyone who lives in Bulgaria uh, that they can't do uh, what many of us have experienced here and it's not as easy as they think. So to leave Bulgaria here for many of my participants, such as Kalina and Ivan, requires courage and determination and strong will. Um, so as the remark here suggests, you know, uh, the migratory decision is almost kind of portrayed as, uh, as a rite of passage. Um, but at the same time, we can see this is quite problematic as well, because it has got that undertone um, that, you know, ultimately stigmatizes those who choose not to migrate, further deepening the rift between stayers and leavers. And actually, we can see that more clearly that it's sometimes in aiming to neutralize um, the stigmatizing function of these home society uh, stereotypes, participants implicitly or explicitly actually undermine their fellow um, co-national's choice to stay in Bulgaria. And we see this again in uh, uh, Paula's um, comment here that there are very few quality people uh, in Bulgaria um, and those who have stayed uh, are those who for some reason could not leave. And most recently in kind of um, in our uh, most recent project with uh, Elisabetta, um, a lot of that kind of dismissal and trying to uh, disassociate uh, um, yourself from fellow compatriots manifest also itself in support for Brexit um, and actually support for the implementation of restrictions uh, in the new migratory flows. So um, Krasimir, who is a factory worker, says, I'm really angry when I get compared to a gypsy who has come here and committed a crime and I get the same treatment because I'm also Bulgarian. So what I want to kind of highlight here very um, briefly is that ultimately this strategy has um, kind of very important uh, class undertones and, um, you know, again, we can see how ethnicity really matters. Uh, but I think it's important to also consider that migrant social positionings when they try and employ uh, this strategy of 
uh, dismissal. Kind of very briefly also, another very different strategy is where migrants try to reinvent national identity. And they tried to do that by drawing on a very old narrative, 18th century narrative, whereby um, the children of um, kind of uh, rich Bulgarian merchants were actually able to um, you know, study abroad and kind of pick up ideas of enlightenment. And um, uh, as a result of that, they returned to the country and kind of um, started uh, uh, movements for national freedom, uh, uprisings, and so on and so forth. So some of my participants also kind of drew on that idea of, you know, the newest Bulgarian uh, migratory outflows are very similar. So uh, my participant Boyan here, um, who is in uh, uh, his mid-20s, also kind of points out that this is the second Bulgarian revival. And this is something that is very slowly happening. So he recognizes that um, this is um, indeed, um, you know, um, something, uh, he recognizes that the Bulgarian kind of uh, community abroad is very divided. It's happening though in organic way, um, according to him. Um, but at the same time, again, it's the idea is that these people are abroad. So it's kind of almost like reframing the migratory choice as a necessity, as something that directly benefits uh, the nation. And that also manifests itself in some very kind of practical um, uh, kind of uh, um, activities such as political activism and civic uh, engagement. And th this came very strongly uh, in uh, kind of uh, the, the latest two uh, anti-governmental protests. So the, the first one uh, happened in 2013, 2014, and it started as an anti-austerity protest, then kind of grew as a wider anti-establishment movement. And most recently, Bulgaria has gone a series of, of protests again um, against the, the political establishment and uh, uh, the status quo. And, you know, while they share some similarities, they also have differences in terms of kind of the institutional support they've had or not, uh, and so on and so forth. But something that was quite characteristic in, in both of these protests that they were mainly driven by young people. Uh, and again, this generation of the children of the transition, people who also um, joined in with the Bulgarian diaspora abroad, mainly uh, young people. And actually, in the first round of protests, I had participants who kind of talked about, you know, how passionate they were, how active uh, they were um, in those protests. But at the same time, again, those uh, efforts were not recognized by those who were uh, behind, uh, you know, who were back uh, in Bulgaria. Um, and that's what um, uh, some of the comments on Facebook, for example, that, that they had is, you know, great that you're supporting this, but, you know, when Bulgaria is this Scottish city. And something similar happened this summer. Again, the involvement of the Bulgarian diaspora and the young people who had returned home for the summer was dismissed as almost as an act of, uh, they're just back home to take a selfie and they'll return back to the good life uh, abroad. So these efforts were very much kind of dismissed. Um, and again, it was almost a missed opportunity to bridge the rift between um, stayers and leavers. And then finally, very briefly, I'm aware that I've kind of gone slightly over time here. Uh, the reinvention of national identity also has um, uh, kind of uh, some cultural aspects as, as well, whereby um, self-initiated uh, kind of uh, uh, organizations or, you know, kind of very informal uh, organizations started by uh, Bulgarian migrants um, aimed to uh, popularize Bulgarian culture, Bulgarian food um, and uh, traditions abroad. So that is kind of seen as almost kind of an ambassadorial act that see we're here abroad, but we, we're here with a purpose to um, actually uh, improve the image of the country and you know spread awareness. So very briefly in a, in a nutshell, I just wanted to uh, highlight uh, how Bulgarian migratory outflows are quite polarized in the public discourse. Um, and um, actually othering very clearly emerges or kind of recurs um, in uh, critical moments of political unrest. So these, uh, this kind of narrative of uh, migration as, as a national betrayal and escapism, even though it's deeply rooted in kind of migration during the communist regime, actually continues to uh, resurge in moments of crisis or moments of protest and unrest. And governmental responses actually have often oscillated between kind of seeing the Bulgarian diaspora as an asset or sometimes as a threat. And this very clearly came through 
in the latest changes to the electoral code, uh, which eventually, after a lot of compromises, recognized Bulgarians abroad as a separate constituency. But at the same time, there was quite a lot of debate as to how much, um, you know, how many votes or uh, MP seats uh, would that elect. And again, this uh, due to the fragmented parliament, you know, this is something to uh, be debated further. Um, and also, um, what is quite interesting that these stereotyping discourses that are produced in home societies actually result in either these dismissive strategies or in approaches that aim to reinvent national identity to reclaim belonging, but at the same time, both of these strategies are actually deeply problematic because rather than trying to bridge the rift uh, between stairs and levers, it actually um, further deepens it um, and kind of, uh, it's interesting that migrants themselves kind of in turn ostracize and stereotype those who actually choose, um, uh, choose to stay uh, in the country. Um, and as I've already kind of highlighted, uh, recent protests um, uh, and parliamentary elections in the country uh, have been this missed opportunity to bridge the rift between migrants and non-migrants. And I think this is likely to become even more problematic post-COVID as you know the social positionings of both migrants and uh, non-migrants uh, shift in that very uncertain uh, climate. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm very sorry it took so much time. Thank you very much, 